The Ireland, the country of St. Patrick, its patron saint, he who introduced the Celtic cross into religious rites and who, according to tradition, freed her from snakes. But this is a lie. There have never been snakes in Ireland. The island is also called the Emerald Country because of its endless variations of the color green. There are 137 different shades of it. It is a country with its own distinctive and unmistakable music. It can be heard everywhere in pubs and along the streets, accompanied by a characteristic way of dancing with your hands, perpendicular to your taste and with your legs moving in a kind of tip-tap. But Ireland is above all the beer. There are hundreds of different kinds and there is no public place where several hectolitres of it are not drunk daily. And among the beers, one must above all be remembered Guinness. A beer born by accident and become the symbol of Ireland itself. A beer that fills hundreds of mugs in pubs and outdoors. Born in Dublin, an entire neighbourhood is the seat of its production. There where the house of the founder of the brewery is kept. And since Guinness had taken over my travels years ago, it seems fitting to begin the journey under the factory gates. But before we leave, impossible not to admire this young Irish girl romping in a traditional dance. Leaving Dublin, we take a bus to the city of Cork at the beginning of the wild Atlantic Way. The road, moreover, is marked beautifully throughout the island. Unloading the bikes from the bus, we are ready in a few moments. The dance begins. We expected wind, clouds and rain. Instead, the island is generous and lets us pedal for a few days under bright sunshine and an ideal temperature, almost Mediterranean. We pass through small villages located along the wild Atlantic Way. Only four million people live in a country a quarter the size of Italy. That is half as many as in 1845, when a terrible famine killed part of the population, and an impressive number of Irish emigrated to America. As a result, traffic is sparse, so even on the main roads one travels well and without risk to a cyclist. It is sufficient to remember to pedal on the left. The road skirts some small inlets, characterized by tides with major differences in height, so local people normally moor sideways, English style, waiting for low tide to clean hulls to boats. Although there are no mountains in Ireland, the route is nervous with continuous ups and downs, sometimes with steep ramps and the gradients when evening comes are felt in the legs. But the view of the coast, unusual for us, is really engaging. Pity only for prices, 17 euros and 90 cents for a hamburger. The White Atlantic is a popular route, so it is not surprising to meet fellow cyclists. Strange, if anything, are some characters, like these towing a cart equipped with a panel, and these Frenchmen with children in tow, but on bikes pulled by their parents. There is a ferry to cross the fjord that separates the counties of Limerick from that of Clare. And once past the fjord, we resume north again by the side of an ocean that, though very cold, does not deter a few reckless swimmers. They will undoubtedly be Germans. If you decide to camp, don't fool yourself. The days may be warm, but during the night it is freezing, so don't forget a good sleeping bag. The weather continues to be definitely nice for a few more days, but this is Ireland. Never trust the weather and the forecast. Pedaling along the road, I am reminded of an Irish proverb that says, if you want the weather to change, sit for a moment and wait. And indeed, as soon as we pass a cliff that inspires local musicians, the first ominous clouds appear, heralding rain showers. The weather seems to get worse as the minutes pass, and as we approach the town of Kelki, we pull our waterproof jackets out of our bags. They will not be put away again for several days. From Kelki departs a stretch of land heading westward. Entering that peninsula, we follow a deserted coastal road that faces an impressive series of high cliffs precipitous above the sea. After a little over 20 kilometers, we come to the Ross Bridges. 
These were three huge stone arches high above the ocean shore, but two arches have collapsed. Only one remains, and under the arch floats curious seaweed that looks like a maiden's hair stirred by the waves. Just beyond is a lonely lighthouse on a windswept cliff. It takes a full day, accompanied by frequent downpours to pass the small town of Lehinch, past which, under a grey sea we meet on the road, the cliffs of Mohair. They are perhaps the most visited place in Ireland. Eight kilometers long and battered by an incessant wind, they reach a height of more than 200 meters. It has been bad weather for a week already, and there are no signs of improvement on the horizon. Hence the reason for my helmet cover, very Irish style, which apart from giving me a touch of understated elegance, keeps the rain from getting in my eyes. We arrive in Doolin, a microscopic village that, apart from a couple of nice lodgings, boasts a mysteriously famous pub. The house specialty, of course, is Irish music, accompanied by gallons of beer. But we still have quite a few miles left to run under our wheels. We have to cross the counties of Mayo, Sligo, Leicester and Donegal, our final destination. Along the way are a series of villages that show their maritime vocation, and at whose docks rest fishing boats that show signs of the hard struggle with the sea. The weather, of course, remains Irish. That is very variable, but mostly rainy. Very rainy. We arrive in Linan for the night under a deluge and with our clothes completely wet. On our departure, we skirt the north side of Killary Harbour, in fjord more than 16 kilometers deep. The northern shores are in County Mayo, and the southern shores are in County Galway. And they are separated by a river that, when it flows into the fjord, forms a waterfall. Only after a few hours does the rain cease to wash us, replaced, however, by wind that at least dries us a little. The day did not seem to be born under a good star, but things definitely get worse at lunchtime because we find one of the very few places in Ireland where they do not serve beer. We spend an entire afternoon in the saddle before finding a village where wholesome Irish traditions are respected. We have been on the road for more than two weeks, following the wild Atlantic Way, this coastal route that measures 1,300 kilometers, a route almost always facing the ocean, where we can encounter small fishing ports and a few isolated traditional stone churches. Throughout the journey, we were accompanied by a landscape that was curious to us that I couldn't define otherwise than as Irish. A green landscape of intense colors where ruins of castles and old houses rise facing that ocean where you can still find old observation towers from Napoleonic times put there to spot an invasion that never came and isolated cliff-top lighthouses to signal the right sail away. One more effort, just a few more days still following the wild Atlantic way we have only 150 kilometers to go. It has also stopped raining, not that it is sunny, but it feels good. The last stop takes us as far as the town of Donegal, which, like almost all Irish towns, proudly maintains a very traditional appearance with those stone buildings that give an unmistakable look to Irish towns. Not far from Donegal, we can admire the cliffs of Sleeve League. They are less popular than those in Moha, but in my personal opinion, they are even more impressive. They are also our arrival point. We return to Dublin, where we have an appointment with our friend Darinka. The rendezvous is near the dock, where the replica of the Genie Johnston, a historic ship, is moored. The story goes that during the Great Famine immigration of 1845, which brought a million Irish to America, this was the only ship on which no one died during the crossing. Darinka and fiancé run a nice initiative. 
evening kayaking on the waters of the Dublin River listening to music. Ragazzi, ma com'è andato il viaggio? Bello, bellissimo, molto bello. Direi che dovremmo tornare, anzi, torniamo, facciamo qualcosa e brindiamo il nostro ritorno. Sì, che dici? Fatto. C'è poco da brindare qua, piatto piange. Ah, non puoi andare a prendere nulla. Le abbiamo finite tutte. Chiamiamo Sant'Arnolfo. Sant'Arnolfo, eh. ottima idea, bella idea. Ma chi è Sant'Arnolfo? Sant'Arnolfo, non conosce Sant'Arnolfo. No. Ma è il protettore dei Masti di Rai, adesso te lo presento. Questa qui è la sua immaginetta sacra. È l'uomo dei miracoli, stai attento. <ride> I santi non sono in vendita, i santi vanno pregati e venerati, però possiamo brindare. Alla prossima! Salute! Alla prossima. Grazie Sant'Arnolfo!